Uh, Ghalia, can I ask you to disable screen share for now, please? Sure. We'll just give people a few minutes to come in, etc. Thank you, Majid and Hamza. I don't know who you guys are, but you are complimenting our backgrounds. Wink, <laughs> wink. <laughs> Okay, so we can kick off the session while uh, more people tune in, inshallah. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. Good evening, Masakum Allah Khair. Welcome to our third and last workshop in the second day of the workshop series as part of the KFAS COVID-19 hackathon. Uh, we're gonna end the day on a real high with a, an awesome guest, somebody who I've been looking forward to ever since we booked her, um, Ms. Ghalia Al-Ansari. I'll tell you a little bit more about Ghalia in a sec. Uh, as always, remember that throughout the workshop, if you want to ask any questions, feel free to use the Q&A box. And if you like a question in there, you can upvote it. And feel free to also engage us on the chat if you want to leave a comment or a question there if you prefer. Uh, and just a couple of housekeeping notes for you guys. Uh, remember that tomorrow we also have three truly terrific speakers starting at 6, 6 p.m. Kuwait time. Uh, a wide variety of topics. We're going to cover tomorrow some data science, some design, and some coding with Go. So if anybody's interested in some backend development, uh, be sure to tune in to that talk at 7 p.m. Uh, and remember that the hackathon itself, for those participating, will start Friday. 6 p.m. with a briefing before at 5 p.m. So make sure that you get enough sleep. If you have any questions or concerns, be sure to ping the coded team on uh, Discord. Uh, so today we're going to end uh, the day with a workshop on one of my favorite subjects, data, data science and data analytics, uh, with our very own Ghalia Al Ansari. Ghalia is a coded alumni, and we are very very proud to call her Coded Alumni. In fact, she's not just a Coded Alumni, she is actually an instructor at Coded uh, who crafted and taught our uh, data bootcamp that we ran earlier this year. Uh, Ghalia actually has a degree in political science from New York University, NYU. Uh, and today she is the CTO and co-founder of Cure, a pharmaceutical tech app that will launch really soon, inshallah. And I'm looking forward to seeing it, inshallah, Ghalia, once it's out. And maybe you can share it with the, with the community. Uh, so thank you, Ghalia, for being with us. Without further ado, the mic is yours. Thank you, Hashim. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If I could just get a second to share my screen. So as Hashem mentioned, uh, this talk is gonna be about data and specifically about leveraging data infrastructure for small and medium enterprises. Now, uh, I want this to be conversational. Uh, so we're gonna cover, not particularly in this order, but we're gonna cover uh, the importance of data, some common definitions and misconceptions, uh, some perceived barriers to entry, uh, and then finally, I'm going to try to wrap up by giving some infrastructure tips and some tips specifically for the participants in the hackathon. So why data? Uh, International Data Center, which is one of the biggest uh, data firms that's been around, I believe, from the 60s, recently published their 2025 uh, prediction report, which predicts that by 2025, 
we're going to have a minimum of 163, I'm not even sure how to pronounce this, zezabytes or zezabytes uh, of data in the world, and 60% of which is going to be managed by enterprises. Uh, another interesting uh, another interesting prediction is that 1.8 trillion dollars is going to be leached from uh, data agnostic or um, data illiterate firms into data uh, literate firms. Uh, so as you can see, these numbers are no joke. These are pretty huge numbers. Um, so let's get to it. Now, uh, before we dive into the definition of data analytics, uh, let's just uh, talk about other common terms or buzzwords that you might hear. Uh, there's BI or business intelligence, and there's data science, there's data analytics, there's big data and all of those buzzwords. So uh, to keep things simple, uh, BI or business intelligence is usually a present centric. So it's focused on the present term which means that firms who uh, use uh, business intelligence usually look at historical performance data. Uh, so uh, whether you're a big company or a small business, you'd look at, um, let's say, uh, the amount of visitors to your website or users of the app for the last few months and so on. Uh, whereas if you're a firm who's trying to, um, uh, who's trying to apply different data uh, science elements uh, into your business, you would be more future centric which means that you would use the historical data, but not to explain the present, but to make it future focused. Uh, data science is as such very interdisciplinary, which is why you see people from many different uh, educational backgrounds or work backgrounds getting into data science. And in fact, that's even encouraged. Uh, so for example, you have people with uh, degrees in stats, degrees in the humanities and so on. Uh, you will also see a lot of uh, applications of artificial intelligence in data science because data science is future centric. Therefore, you will need a lot of predictions in the process and uh, a lot of more complex automations that is that would only be possible by using uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, data science also can be broken down into prescriptive or predictive, whereas business intelligence uh, is more commonly uh, exploratory. Uh, so for prescriptive, you are uh, trying to solve a problem, but for predictive, you're trying to predict something again in the future. Now, what makes a uh, data analyst or what makes a data scientist or what even makes a business, uh, a business intelligence uh, professional? So curiosity, because all of these uh, professionals use data. So curiosity is to data what hypothesis is to the scientific method. Uh, now, I'm sure all of us at some point, uh, even so far back as uh, to elementary, were taught that uh, you know when you wanna conduct a scientific experiment, uh, the first step for the scientific method is to use your observations to create a hypothesis that you will then later test with your uh, scientific experiment. Uh, the same exact thing can be said about the relationship between curiosity and data. Uh, in fact, Peter uh, Norwig or Norvig uh, of Google uh, once stated something along the lines of that um, better data beats more data, which means that yes, you might have uh, access to uh, a sea of data, whether uh, you're a small business, a uh, medium enterprise, or even uh, a big firm, uh, but having the curiosity to, to help you ask uh, the right questions or the questions that others aren't will make the difference between uh, good data and more data. Uh, this is uh, from one of uh, a very interest uh, from one of uh, my favorite movies, which is a movie about the role of data. Uh, I believe it was uh, based on a book by Michael Lewis, and it's about uh, how data was used uh, by a baseball team to improve performance. So this is uh, one of my favorite quotes right here. It says, adapt or die. And as you saw from um, the stats that I showed earlier, uh, it's paramount now more than ever for firms to embrace data literacy. So what does that mean? Uh, specifically in the context of small and medium enterprises. Let's just go back to this. Uh, so a common barrier to entry is people's perceptions. A lot of small business owners or uh, medium enterprise owners that I've interacted with have told me things like, um, well, I don't know stats or um, I don't 
I don't have uh, the budget uh, to use maybe um, very expensive software that would do uh, machine learning predictions and stuff like that. Uh, but the thing is, there are platforms out there that provide uh, solutions fit for small and medium businesses. So for example, a very common one is Google Analytics. Uh, it's completely free if you use it up to a certain point. Um, and in fact, you can build your entire data infrastructure, which we'll get into later, uh, using the Google platform. Uh, so another thing to keep in mind that just because you have a smaller consumer base or customer base and therefore generate a smaller amount of data, uh, that does not mean that you don't have anything uh, valuable within that uh, sample or uh, population uh, that you have. So again, curiosity is key here. Uh, and in fact, I would wager to say that uh, small and medium enterprises are in a better position to be competitive with making data-driven decisions because they have the flexibility to pivot. So when you're a traditional business, uh, whether in finance, like you're a big bank, um, or you're in the energy sector and you have uh, a big team of workers and an, an infrastructure that's been there for years, uh, there are many, many obstacles to change. Uh, first and foremost, you have all the logistics of change, uh, the legalities of change, but more importantly, um, the human element because humans and organizations are very resistant to change. So when you're a smaller or uh, medium enterprise, you have the advantage uh, that's akin to the first mover advantage, but within a data context uh, of making the pivot to embrace tools, experiment with tools and see what works. Essentially, you have the luxury of conducting experiments and bearing the risk that maybe big firms don't, which again is amazing at this point in time, especially given the current circumstances. Now, going back to the, to the uh, Peter Norwick quote, better data beats more data. What makes something good data and bad data? Uh, it, to put it in um, industry jargon, there's this concept of noisy data, but then there's also this concept of clean data. And this really comes down to how you define it. So if you, if you wanted to define it in technical terms, uh, then for example, um, if you had uh, fake customer emails, that would be considered bad data or noisy data. Or, or if you had um, a mix of data in Arabic and English, uh, no format, that would be very unstructured and noisy data. But in more general terms, uh, from a business point of view, good data is, is basically whether or not you turn this raw information into insight. Uh, I know this sounds like an oversimplification, but it really is that simple. You have, um, you have raw data coming uh, from your Twitter feeds, your Instagram feeds. Uh, you have data from um, your surveys, if you send surveys. You can also have raw data from your own interactions with your customers. Uh, you have uh, data from your websites or uh, your applications. Uh, you can also get uh, raw data from competitors who already um, have, have done this data collection process, um, if it's public. Um, but yeah, so, so the misconception that there's, there are huge barriers to entry uh, for a small or medium enterprise is utterly false. And I would highly encourage the participants of the hackathon or anyone tuning in to think about how they might introduce uh, the concept of embracing data into their own organizations or businesses. Uh, now, when it comes to data infrastructure, there are, again, two approaches to it. You can look at it from a business uh, point of view, which is the concept of, oh, let me go and, and get some training uh, for, um, for people to be able to interpret data within my firm. Or it can be something more technical, uh, like where do I house all the data that I'm already collecting? Um, in technical terms, uh, there are two types of uh, data infrastructure, there's uh, something called converged and hyper-converged. So you can think of converged as uh, old school data centers. Uh, you know, those images of like big computers in some basement, uh, big um, uh, processing hardware. So that that's more considered uh, converged uh, architecture or um, uh, converged architecture, sorry. And um, the opposite to that would be the hyper-converged 
or software uh, focused architecture, which is lowering cost and more highly scalable and a lot more flexible. So again, uh, but this kind of levels the field between all businesses, regardless of size, because you have all these uh, SaaS solutions to, to uh, your data questions. Um, so I'll just uh, stop at this point to see if there are any questions before we move on. Uh, I think right now there are no questions, uh, Radio, and uh, we'll let the audience kind of just ask them on the, on the, by the end. Sure. All right. So, so far we've covered, uh, we've, we've covered the tip of the iceberg really about why data is valuable, uh, some common definitions, and we went over the main uh, misconception, which is the barriers to entry to the data field. Um, and we brushed upon uh, the two, the two main types of infrastructure uh, in a business sense and also in a technical sense. So now let's focus more on the technical sense. Uh, so how do I get started? I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I just uh, started a firm. Uh, I've been getting a steady growth of clients or a perceived growth of clients. Uh, so how do I, how do I uh, confirm or correct these assumptions that I have? Because a lot of the times you might think that you're doing well when you're not doing well or the other way around. And I think um, for those who uh, were there for uh, Haider's talk yesterday, uh, Haider mentioned that it's very important to, to keep in mind as a designer or product designer uh, that your assumptions might be wrong. You might think that your solution to a problem is what people want, but that's not the case. Uh, so how do I go about doing that? So when you have small data and small data is defined as I'd say something roughly under like uh, six terabytes, let's say like eight to six terabytes. Uh, here you have a lot of flexibility in terms of the technology that you want to use. Uh, and I'm personally very biased towards anything Python based. Uh, so I would encourage uh, people to look into picking up uh, uh, Python and, and pandas where you can conduct, uh, where we can very seamlessly conduct a lot of exploratory data analysis uh, for your business. Uh, uh, and that- sorry, I don't mean I don't mean to interrupt you, Ali, I'm sorry, but uh, sure. I think the, the screen is uh, frozen on a slide that you might have moved past. I'm not uh, sure. Oh, are you no. still on the right side? No, I, okay. I, yeah. Okay, just, yeah. I thought I heard you clicking, so I just wanted to be, okay, go ahead, uh, sorry. No worries. Um, so once, once you have the tools that will allow you to manipulate the data at hand, because again, uh, a lot of this data comes from different sources, uh, whether it's clean or raw data, and you have surveys, like we said, uh, you have customer feedback, you have uh, um, app performance, uh, sales revenue data, stuff like that. Uh, so once you have the technical know-how to put this data together, whether you wanna go ahead and uh, learn, pick up a language like Python, which I highly encourage people to do, or rely on a more traditional uh, BI uh, software that would um, have you learn less code, but still have you uh, warehouse everything in one place. Um, that would be the first step, I'd say. Um, and then it would be learning a more sophisticated, sophisticated way to uh, manipulate this data. Because again, the point here is scalability and reproducibility. Uh, so you don't want, uh, for time's sake, just one or two people learning these skills and then not having everyone else on the team being able to, to use the skills, especially when you're starting out. Uh, so focusing on another very important um, human-friendly language would be something like SQL, which would allow you to maybe not focus on the nuances of an object programming language like Python, and instead focus on using uh, English-like syntax to manipulate your data. Uh, so running queries like something like uh, from this table, get me uh, so-and-so customer data. Uh, so now you have your tools, uh, now you have your technical know-how, and the third stage would be graduating to a more uh, robust data pipeline structure, which uh, to me is uh, automating this workflow. So, so because we said we want to focus on reproducibility and scalability, again, even if you're, you're a team of 10 and all 10 of you learn these skills, 
um, it's not really efficient for you to run all the analysis from scratch every time. So this is where learning how to automate that stuff uh, will, will pay a lot in, in the medium, short, and long run. There are, again, a lot of uh, tools out there that you can use, uh, a lot of open source software like Airflow, uh, which is my favorite to recommend. Um, and then you can also scale uh, your data warehouse, uh, whether it's in-house, so whether you save your data on your server, offline, online, or a cloud solution like uh, Google Cloud uh, or uh, something Amazon-based. Um, these, these all essentially do the, do the same thing. Um, the third, the third step here would be to, to focus on graduating from the thing that just makes you house and manipulate data to, to the thing that would make you translate this data to, to other stakeholders, team members, or even yourself. And this is where, um, focusing on the human center, uh, uh, human centric aspect of, uh, of data comes into play. So it's highly encouraged for anyone, regardless of their background, uh, when they're dealing with data to try to uh, read more widely, uh, to try to talk to people from different industries and to again, follow your curiosity uh, because that's the difference between, as Peter put it, more data and better data. And that is it for now. So I'll give the mic back to you, Hashem. Thank, thank you, Ghalia. Uh, that, was, that was a great kind of intro into the, the world of, uh, of data, data analytics, and like a really quick crash course on everything. I hope our audience had a chance to kind of just um, digest as much of it as possible. Uh, may I ask you, please, Ghalia, to stop sharing your screen so we can go into uh, gallery mode. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, so right off the bat, Ghalia, uh, there's, a, there's a great question that we have from the audience, a few questions. Um, so you mentioned uh, Python as, as a good kind of starter language to get your hands dirty with. Uh, one member of the audience is asking what you think about R and whether R is a substitute a good substitute for python or is, are there nuances in each language that maybe make it a better option depending on the use sure. so that's a very great and very common question uh and i would say from experience personally um that when i first uh decided to get into data i tr i didn't uh, know about python so i started with r the resources that i found were purely in r uh, but I found it a bit intimidating because uh, R is specifically formulated as a statistics heavy language. And at that point in time, I thought that that would create, like we said, like a barrier to entry. I felt like, oh, mm. that, you know, that, that's not my thing. It would take a lot, a lot of time to learn it. Maybe now is not the time. Maybe I'll do it later. Uh, so it put me off to the concept of, of uh, uh, learning. Uh, but also, um, I find the syntax of Python a lot more human friendly, just like SQL. So it's a lot easier to pick up, especially if you're a person without a background in coding or computer science. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that um, the debate between R versus Python is becoming more and more moot, in my opinion, because yes, at some point in time, uh, R had an advantage over Python when it comes to its uh, statistical prowess. Uh, but the very active and amazing community of Python um, programmers keep releasing libraries uh, that j do just that. So now you have the advantage of getting statistical power horse libraries like NumPy and Scikit or SciPy without having to the, the downside of learning R, in my opinion. But of course, there are uh, people biased towards both languages. So I'm sure if you ask an R person, they'd say otherwise. Which is why we don't ask them because code yeah, is all exactly. about Python. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, and there's a question that's kind of a nice follow up to that one uh, from sure. Haya. She's asking whether uh, for data science, especially in the field of academia, uh, uh, you, would you recommend something maybe different than Python? Perhaps 
uh, perhaps MATLAB or Julia. I haven't heard of Julia before, so uh, I'm not sure what that is, but just basically, is there, is there an alternative to Python that would be more apt for academia? Uh, I would say if you look at the trend within academia, uh, it was very R focused, but more and more universities and professors and researchers are moving towards Python for the reasons that I stated. Um, but uh, I guess it depends on which uh, field within academia you're talking about. Uh, because if you're, uh, let's say, in the social sciences, I'd, sciences, I'd say Python will get the job done. Um, but if you're in something that's maybe more engineering based, which is from my experience where I see people use MATLAB a lot uh, in engineering disciplines, then I'd say stick to that. Uh, you, you've just made me think of a question that's a little bit of a tangent and I'll get back to the Q&A, but given that your background is technically in, in policy, you know, mm -hmm. from school uh, and you went to one of the best policy schools in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world and in the United mm -hmm. States, do you feel like that gave you a slight advantage in the sense that you aren't trained as a classical engineer, which means that you're able to see maybe a different side to the equation, maybe you're able to uh, do better in terms of garnering these insights from data as opposed to just looking at the technicalities and the raw data? Well, I was, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to not only um, uh, immerse myself in a humanities field, uh, like you said, where it's more traditionally focused on like critical thinking and creativity as opposed to like following a certain system, which is kind of similar to what I said uh, about um, like big uh, big firms and them having less flexibility than smaller or medium enterprises. Uh, I definitely think that that gives me an advantage uh, because again, I don't think within um, a certain discipline. Uh, I was also uh, fortunate enough to have a very well-rounded uh, education there where uh, I got to take the science classes, the math classes, but also the humanities classes. So I definitely think um, that trying to make yourself as interdisciplinary as possible by something like reading more widely or interacting with people from different disciplines will give you a big advantage. That's beautiful advice. Uh, there's a quick question here from Sheikha. Uh, are there any data visualization tools that you would recommend? And I think uh, to kind of make that question more specific, uh, are there any data visualization tools that you'd recommend for beginners and perhaps maybe for the hackathon participants who aren't so well versed or don't have to, the time to become well versed with the world of data? Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're a person who comes from an Excel background, then I say continue to use that. But if you're a person who knows Python, uh, I would highly recommend getting into Plotly. Uh, Plotly is a very interactive and modern visualization library, which allows you to do a lot in as little code as possible. Uh, if, if you do have some time to prepare, like let's say over the weekend or uh, in a day or two, I'd say get into Tableau because if you know how to use Excel, you can figure out Tableau in, in a short amount of time. And I think the visualizations in Tableau are, are a bit more sophisticated than those in Excel. I just wrote those two uh, tools down for everyone in the chat. Uh, thank you for that, Valia. Um, so there's a question here that's getting some, some love from the audience. And, I, and I've asked you this question person before and it's, it's something we talk about often, the fact that people confuse data analysis or data mm -hmm. analytics with data science. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question is, in brief layman terms, Alia, how would you explain to somebody what the core difference between the two is from a practical standpoint? Mm -hmm. And then the second follow-up to that is, do you think there is demand for data science in, in Kuwait? And I'll take that more broadly and I say is that demand for it in the general, maybe Middle Eastern ecosystem? All right, excellent questions. Uh, to address the first one, I would say that personally from having many conversations and uh, from reading about the, the debate, uh, I'd say that data analytics encompasses both business intelligence and data science. I know some people prefer to conceptualize it the other way around, but to me, it's simpler to think of data analytics as a big umbrella uh, under which falls things like data science and business intelligence. Uh, again, the main difference being uh, data science is more focused on the future, prescriptive, predictive, uh, machine learning uh, versus business intelligence, which is more present focused, 
and focus on using historical data to explain the present, which I think is uh, used interchangeably with data analytics, like BI data analytics. Yeah. And so the second part of that question then, is there demand for data science in this part of the world? So this is a question that uh, if we have any people who've taken uh, the uh, data bootcamp uh, with us here, this is a question that I actually asked them on the orientation day because this is a question that I love to ask. Um, mm. Personally, I think even if there isn't a perceived demand for it, uh, because again, um, you can sell data as your product or, so, so that's, that's to me what I understand demand to be. Like, can I have a data analytics firm in Kuwait? Or the, uh, the other aspect, which I think is more pressing, in, in especially in these times, which is to use data within your own enterprises to gain an advantage over your competitors. Because again, everyone's operating on a lot of assumptions all the time. And there's even a, a, a whole field dedicated to that called uh, behavioral economics. There's a great book yeah. by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow that challenges even things that you take as like um, obvious truths. Um, so yeah. I highly encourage people to, to read that book. Absolutely. And uh, I think more and more data science is kind of, as you said at the beginning of your presentation, it's kind of sipping into different disciplines that people don't anticipate. In fact, uh, there's a book, I can't remember the name now, but I heard about it because I, I heard, I listened to a podcast uh, with the author. It's all about data driven parenting, which to me sounds amazing. So whenever I become a father, I'm reading that book because it, it takes, it takes the guesswork and myth out of certain controversial things like for example should you let the baby cry themselves to sleep or should you should you hold them or all these different kind of things where you know it's old folklore versus data driven and i'd rather be on the data driven side uh but exactly. that was just a side tangent but yeah absolutely and and in our data bootcamp uh Rali, if you remember uh we had a few people coming in from their companies and mm -hmm. there was definitely practical application to what we taught which was more on the data analysis side but would you say that you can see maybe hints of these companies maybe the larger organizations or startups evolving to introduce more data science in their operations i think uh it will start with uh international firms within the ecosystem of uh, firms in kuwait so for example, um, uh, international banks or even like uh, Bank of Abu Dhabi or the Bank of Qatar in Kuwait, I think those will be the leaders in, in uh, starting to adopt these practices. And then we're gonna see local firms um, adopt uh, these practices as well. Uh, this is very similar to what happened with the, the concept of e-commerce, which is now exploding mm -hmm. locally. Uh, but yeah. even though, you know, if we wanna make it uh, based on data, even though uh, we had one of the highest internet and phone penetration rates in the region for across all age groups. We didn't really see any e-commerce presence except for the last maybe five years, I'd say, or even less. So that's definitely something to watch out for. Yeah, I think you're right. I think e-commerce becoming mainstream, if you will. That took, that took a decade or so for it to happen. Yes. Uh, and I think in terms of data science, people will start adopting, to, adopting to, companies will start adopting it once they see the competitive advantage that you can get from having a strong data science capability. So we'll see maybe what the next few years I will tell. And obviously we encourage our audience to stay ahead of the curve uh, so that you can have that competitive advantage. Uh, there's a great question here by Majid. It's a bit technical. What are the common pitfalls uh, in selecting data for analysis? Mm. Um, the biggest one I'd say is your own assumptions. Because again, even if you're using uh, BI software, the person who built the software put their own assumptions into building it. Um, even if they mm. did so um, unconsciously or subconsciously. Um, so I think that would be the biggest obstacle because uh, it's very tempting to, to know the result that you want and then to try to find the data that backs that up. So you need to have curiosity and you need to keep an open mind that sometimes or most times you won't like the answer. Uh, just to give a personal anecdote about this. Um, so the very first uh, prediction engine that I built was a very small uh, movie recommendation engine, which is like a, the hello world of uh, prediction engines. Uh, so I thought that 
oh, like I think I have decent taste in movies. So I'm probably, it's probably going to predict that I watch X, Y, Z. Um, but it actually predicted that I would like one of the worst rated movies on, I think I was using Rotten Tomatoes. So I was surprised by it. So it, it's just like a, a small example of um, how your assumptions can cloud your judgment when you're collecting or interpreting data. Absolutely. And by the way, speaking of movies, uh, the movie you mentioned, Moneyball, is one of my absolute favorites because it combines sports and data, which is like right at the intersection of what I love grail. and I would recommend. <laughs> Absolutely, the Holy Grail. I would encourage everyone to check it out. Um, great question here from Sheikha again. She's asking, from your experience, Ghalia, how do you think deep learning and machine learning can enrich uh, data processing? Um. That, that can go either way. It can, because there is the debate about ethics in data, uh, which isn't as advanced as it is in terms of the debate of privacy. Uh, but especially uh, now with the certain, uh, with the current circumstances where you saw some countries uh, adopting um, uh, surveillance technology to help like spot people with uh, uh, like people who, who might have Corona. Um, so mm. I, I feel like uh, focusing too much or betting too much on deep learning, neural networks and all that stuff um, is bound to, to have a lot of roadblocks down the line. Um, I, think, I think Kuwait's uh, app was featured on one of the articles who claimed that it was one of the apps uh, that was like breaching privacy or something like that, like the app that yeah so okay. um yeah so so it is very powerful but it can go very ways uh it can go either way uh you can yeah. do a lot of good with it you can cut a lot of processing time and effort but it can also go in a more dark direction so i feel like it's going to be artificially slowed down by people who are trying to maintain um ethics and data the same way that people try to vanguard the the uh, privacy and technology in general Right. I think that sounds like an amazing plot for a Black Mirror episode. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because of, because of AI. It might absolutely. not be the most exciting episode, but it was yeah. definitely something. Uh, I think that uh, there's a question here that, that people often ask, uh, Radia, which is, you, I just want to go back to the point you mentioned about having that cognitive bias to want to follow the data towards your own conclusion. And mm -hmm. I think in the hackathon specifically, but more generally in, in startup world, mm -hmm. this is more true than ever because you're like, you make a change, you work on it, you put in your sweat and blood from an engineering perspective. And so, you know, when you're looking at the data, you're totally just looking for that one data point that confirms your bias. Yeah. Uh, how do you actually, what would be your recommendation to, to the engineers uh, on the teams when it comes to that? How do you kind of detach yourself mm -hmm. Uh, from the subjectivity of looking at data and from that confirmation bias that you would probably want to follow? Uh, so I love that question. And I would say the best way to guard your team or yourself against those biases, uh, biases is uh, in numbers. So uh, those who have bigger teams, I, you know, I don't want to scare the smaller teams, but I feel like those who have the teams of what, four or five, I'm assuming, uh, have a more of an advantage here because uh, during your brainstorming sessions for the solutions for the problems that you're gonna have during the hackathon, um, you're gonna get to get more perspectives on this, uh, the solution. Um, but I'd say even then you, you'd run the risk of groupthink. So I would recommend anyone to break down the, the, the solution by first surveying the field. And I believe that's something that another speaker from yesterday, uh, Philip Schmidt mentioned, the importance of surveying the field. Uh, so the way that the participants can do it in a data-driven way is to sort of uh, break down your hypothesis. So I think the solution is going to work. For example, if it's a product-level hypothesis that's focused on like advertising a product, your your one of one of your uh, team members' hypothesis might be, uh, well, the products that advertise more on Instagram usually uh, sell more, uh, or it can be more of a sector-level hypothesis. So you look at market share. Uh, recent trends and that's usually easier to find for um, like financial problems uh, because of the data that's public and stuff like that. Absolutely and I think uh, we have to point here especially when it comes to the data on corona because it's so nascent uh, it's important for all uh, hackathon participants not to conflate causation with correlation 
Absolutely. they're looking at data that might support their product. Uh, how do you separate those two, Ghalia, in your mind? How do you go about making sure that what you're looking at is actually causation, not just correlation? Context, context, context. So if you look at any trend number, you, you, can, you can't just look at it in silos. You have to tie it to, for example, as, with the ex example you gave with uh, Corona numbers. Okay, this is the number of daily cases, the average number of daily cases, but how does it relate to my population? How does it relate to the number of uh, IC, uh, ICU admittance? How does it relate to the number of deaths? So uh, anchoring something uh, or specifically a number or a piece of data to context will clarify any, uh, any misgiving that might lead you down the, the conflation of uh, correlation and causation. Yeah, I remember the first example I heard of correlation versus causation was uh, that kidnapping rates went up when ice cream sales went up. So you know, <laughs> when somebody looked at the data point, they were like, wait, what? Ice cream, ice cream sales lead to more kidnappings. But the reality was happening was ice cream sales would go up in the summer where kids were playing out more in the park. Allah like good yeah. people playing out with the kids. So like, and this is by the way specific to, to the states. Uh, yeah. So it's just a quick example of how people can conflate certain variables when it comes to data analysis. Exactly. Um, there's a question here, and I believe it might be the last question that we can take for the sake of time. Uh, okay. It's from Hey, and I think that's a great question to end with. Um, among all the different tools out there, uh, Ghalia, it can get extremely noisy and yes. intimidating maybe. So for somebody who's just starting out, what would you recommend? What are some of the basic tools that I can maybe just get my hands dirty with initially to get into the world of data? Uh, if, if time is on your side, I'd say invest in yourself and pick up uh, Python or R or whatever language, or even Julia, which is uh, an up and coming and perceived as a competitor Python language. Um, so invest in yourself, learn a language. If you don't end up using it for data, you will end up using it for something else. Uh, if time is not on your side, I'd say invest in learning uh, how to use the existing BI platforms. Uh, the whole Google suite is very helpful. Um, uh, I believe Amazon has uh, a lot of in-depth tutorials about how to use their platform for data. Uh, so I would, I, I would highly encourage you to look into that. Okay, perfect. And uh, there's also a question regarding what sort of maybe courses would you recommend? I think Ali and I shared this. It's completely dependent on your own, you know, learning style, whether mm -hmm. online or in person, uh, you know, online immersive or online on demand. Uh, there is no, I think, one-stop shop for everyone. And we obviously, uh, at Coded, we have the data bootcamp that will probably run sometime again uh, soon. Uh, but I mean, in, in short terms, Ghalia, is there a preferred technique to learning data? Would you recommend somebody to maybe have some best practices when it comes to learning data analytics and maybe data science? Uh, I would say a lot of the online courses um, have a lot of, uh, things in common. So it doesn't matter if you use like the courses on EDX or Coursera or what have you. Uh, but I would say um, learn by doing. Uh, so start with a problem that interests you because again, we want to keep that curiosity alive. Uh, maybe for your own business or um, a member of your family's business or friend's business, uh, try to get them onto Google Analytics and see what kind of information you can extract from that platform um, and then go up from there. Another thing I'd recommend is um, following different people within the data fields or data adjacent fields. Uh, one of my favorite uh, people whose work I'd like to follow is Chris Albin. Uh, there's also the whole uh, team behind 538. Um, and yeah. Uh, just to kind of wrap it up, actually, I just on the same point. Uh, do, you, do you have any recommendations in terms of uh, how the teams in the hackathon in such a short amount of time can actually use data towards what they're trying to build, maybe in the early stages or in the testing phase, um, any, any sort of practical advice that you can give them? Uh, I would say um, you just follow the uh, data analytics etiquette, which is challenger assumptions, always look at the context, uh, survey the field, 
look at the available data. You don't have to reinvent uh, invent the wheel, especially on such short notice. You don't have to, I mean, if you can do things like web scraping and stuff like that, that's awesome. But if you can't and you press uh, for time, just take a look at what's already out there. Yeah, don't get too fancy. And like you said, uh, better data beats more data any day of the week. So concentrate on yeah. quality versus quantity, I guess, yeah? Yes, exactly. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Ali. Unfortunately, we do have to end it. There are still some questions coming in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I think uh, we will try to have you back with us, Ali, at some point, maybe uh, down the road. Inshallah, for people Inshallah. who are interested in data, data analysis. We miss you at Coded, of course, you know that. Uh, and day. hopefully, inshallah, the, uh, everybody in the audience had, had fun with us today with the workshops. As I said, we ended it on a high. Do be sure to tune in tomorrow to another awesome series of workshops. We have yet another lecture from MIT. We also have uh, Burhan Khalid talking about Go. And we have uh, Frank Tineski talking about design thinking and innovation. And I would highly, highly recommend you tune in to every single one of those uh, and spend your Thursday night doing something uh, useful. Thank you again, Ali, for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you all to our audience. Have a great night and uh, see you tomorrow. Ciao. Thank you.